this episode of Biblical Genetics, I want to talk about the origin of life. So I came to a place that represents the opposite of life, death. If you live in the Atlanta area, there are no lack of Civil War battle sites. So I came to Pickett's Mill. I'm not very far from home. It's a beautiful, lovely early fall day. First cool day we've had basically since last March. There's a lovely stream, there's trees, there's birds and squirrels, and you would never know that thousands of men face each other here right across this creek area and threw themselves into a hail of lead and cut, were cut down like a farmer cutting down wheat with a scythe. Now this is important because the origin of life will tell us whether or not we're just a bag of chemicals and these are just chemicals reacting to the chemical stimuli around them, trying to preserve their DNA and pass it on to the next generation just because stuff happens, or if we were actually created in the image of God and these were soulful humans reacting to their environmental stimuli in sinful ways. That's going to tell us a lot about who we are, what it means, what is life, what is death. So the origin of life is a very important topic for theology and for science. Can we answer it? Let's try it. I've been thinking a lot about the origin of life lately. I've been reading this book, The Stairway to Life by Changed Hand and Rob Stadler. This is excellent. This is fantastic. This is one of the best origin of life summaries I've ever come across. By the way, CMI is now carrying this if you'd like to get the stairway to life, you can go to creation.com and buy it if you like. Now, I don't get a cut of those proceeds. So if you want to do me a favor, when you order this in the message area at the bottom of the order form, just type in, I love biblical genetics. But besides that book, on my other podcast, Equinox, that my friend Joe and I do together, we talk about all sorts of scientific concepts. There's fun things in science from, you know, technology to ancient man to astronomy to what's inside the cell. And just last week, we did an episode on the origin of life. You can get that at nightowl.fm slash equinox or on any of your podcasting platforms. Just type in equinox and it will come up. But even after 50 minutes or so of talking, we didn't even begin to scratch the surface on it. So on top of all that, just this week, a brand new paper came out. And I want to spend the rest of this time discussing this paper because it is fascinating and interesting and in many ways, amazing. The title is Synthetic Connectivity, Emergence and Self-Regeneration in a Network of Prebiotic Chemistry. That's very convoluted and detailed and technical and our eyes kind of glaze over when we read stuff like that. But what they essentially did was this. They took all the organic chemistry literature and they codified it as metadata and they fed it into a computer. And they said, computer, calculate for us all the different possible chemical reactions from what we know about organic chemistry. And so, you know how when, um, when, they're, when they're playing chess, right? There's just chess programs and you can look at the board and the computer can calculate into the future all the possible future chess games. Well, that's essentially what they did with organic chemistry. They looked at a set of chemicals and said, what can we do with these chemicals? And they has opened up a giant Pandora's box for the origin of life scenario in ways that are surprising to most people if you just read the literature. Now, I'm also going to include a link to a popular level summary of this paper in case you can't get the actual nature paper, but both will be referenced in the show notes. Now, throughout this video, I'm going to show you a lot of screenshots from a video that the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, they put out as an explanation of this paper and the computer program behind it. I hope you will go and watch this video because it's really interesting. And maybe some of you want to go and find that computer program, play around with it because there's some really fantastically interesting things happening behind the scenes in the metadata of the organic chemistry world. And that's what this computer program is opening for us to see. They titled the video, Alchemy Software Helps chart chemical origins of life. I love that alchemy is a play on words, all chemistry, harking back to the ancient medieval alchemists who were trying to you know, make gold from lead and things like that. But this is all chemistry, all thrown together. And essentially what they did was a digital recreation of the old Miller-Urey experiment. I'm sure you've heard of this, where scientists took very simple uh, chemicals and put them in a flask in water and they heated it up and ran the gases through a spark and then they collected what was left over and kept on recycling it and eventually they created what was claimed the building blocks of life. Well did they really create the building blocks of life? No, what they created was tar. 
a bunch of brownish blackish goo and amongst this tarry chemical soup were a few things that life uses in normal biochemistry. But really what they showed was that random chemical reactions produce random chemicals. And honestly, the origin of life has not progressed very much since then, even though that was decades ago. So now here's a gigantic leap forward in origin of life research on a computer. What did they actually see? Well, they started with these chemicals, water, H2O, hydrogen sulfide, H2S, hydrogen cyanide, HCN, ammonia, NH3, methane, CH4, and nitrogen, N2. Notice there's no phosphorus here. Phosphorus is one of the classic elements required for life. You've probably in biology class heard CHN, OPS, CHNOPS, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. Those are the elements required for living things. There's a couple of more also, but those are the basic ones that all living components are manufactured out of. But there's no P, there's no phosphorus in their starting thing. I don't know why. Interestingly, phosphorus is rare in the wild. Phosphorus, when it runs into a metal, plus two or plus three charge, so iron, manganese, magnesium, it tends to form an insoluble salt and precipitate out a solution. So phosphorus is really hard to find in the natural world, and yet all living things require phosphorus, specifically in DNA and RNA, where each of the letters in DNA and RNA are joined by a phosphate. So living things very carefully and very jealously guard their phosphate, but it's very hard to get out in the natural world. So I don't know why these people started with no phosphate, but it's just an interesting little thing. These six chemicals though, what you can do is you can plug into your computer how many generations you want. One, three, 20. How many possible molecules can you make? If you take these six very simple molecules and react them together, and then react the reactants plus the simple molecules and react and react and react and all sorts of different combinations over time. What can you actually produce? And that was what this thing opened up and it's actually fascinatingly amazing because what they showed was that you can make thousands of molecules in only a couple of steps from the beginning. But what they also showed, in fact, you can see in the graphics, they color code the molecules. The ones with a color are ones used in life. So after five reaction steps, I counted them up, they showed 1,505 molecules. Only 11 of them were colored. That's less than 1%. So already the first take home message is, most of the chemicals that can be produced in random chemistry are not used in biology. In fact, a lot of those chemicals are biological poisons today. And a lot of these molecules being produced are toxic to early prebiotic chemistry because a lot of organic molecules are very reactive. I mean, DNA, even though the, the nucleotides join together in a chain, that's not the only way they can react. All sorts of side chemistry happens because these chemicals have a lot of other places where other molecules can attack. So some of these things that are being produced are very reactive and they would act to destroy the nucleotides, to destroy the amino acids faster probably than they could be produced in the first place. So while all this chemistry is happening, there's a polymerization problem. Life depends upon very long molecules. Nucleotides, stringing together, make DNA or RNA. Sugars, stringing together, make polysaccharides or carbs, carbohydrates. Amino acids, stringing together, make proteins. The problem is every time one of those things gets joined, it kicks out a water molecule. Well, chemistry is reversible, and in this case, water sticking itself in between two of these things and breaking them apart, that reaction happens much more quickly than the opposite. So sure, you could put a whole bunch of amino acids in a, a beaker and set it on a shelf in the laboratory. Warm it up, cool it off, whatever you want to do. Put as many amino acids in there as you want. Come back in a day, a year, a thousand years, a million years. You're not going to find proteins you're gonna find a couple of amino acids who have joined together. You might find some triplicates. You might find very rarely four amino acids in a row. But because water breaks those bonds faster than they form, you cannot get a long chain. 
there's another massive problem in, involved in this, and that is that as you're trying to make a chain, you get all the side branching happening. All these chemicals are cross-reactive in many different ways. Amino acids, they can react in a lot of different ways. And so if you want to get a protein or a nucleotide or a carbohydrate, you're probably just gonna get a bunch of goo, random chemicals. And this is what was telling us. Random chemistry produces random chemistry. Life is not random. Life is single molecule specific precision chemistry. It is nothing like what happens randomly in nature outside of living things. They also very interestingly highlight a few dozen cyclical reactions. Back in the early steps, you can have this molecule can make this molecule, which can make that molecule and react here and produce that same molecule again. And they highlight one in specific in the video, which I'm gonna discuss at length, because this shows us the improbability of these reactions happening on a primordial earth. I mean, sure, you can have a chemical react with another chemical, react with another chemical, and it's growing in size, and then the chemical can split, and now you have two of the original chemical. Oh, that's really cool. This harkens to the Calvin cycle that happens in plants, where you start with a chemical, add carbon dioxide, go in a circle, and you get the same chemical back again. Meanwhile, you're producing sugar. It harkens back to the Krebs cycle that happens in plants and animals where we take sugars and burn them to produce ATP, kicking off carbon dioxide. These are cyclical reactions. And since these massive, complicated cyclical reactions are the basis of life, if they can show that cyclical reactions are trivial, they can say, oh, see that? We can make cycles, therefore life isn't nearly as complex as you think. But look at the picture. They've got a chemical reacting with some stuff in another chemical, but the, they list the reaction conditions. That first step requires a borate buffer at pH 10.2 and zero degrees Celsius. Whoa, wait a minute. Boron, when it reacts with oxygen, makes borate. So if you had a lot of borate in a water solution with ice, because it has to be at zero degrees Celsius, you'd have a very high pH of about 10.2. So I don't know where on this primordial earth this is happening. Maybe there's a boron volcano over, you know, in, up at the North Pole that's producing a borate thing at 10.2 pH and this chemical just happens to be there and it's reacting and producing the next chemical. But the next step requires a totally different set of reaction conditions. The next step is written right there. It needs a pH of six, that's an acidic solution. And you have to add in formaldehyde and cyanide. Oh, so you can't have these conditions in the other place, only in this place. So if over here you have this boron volcano and over here you have a, a warm-ish acidic pool, then maybe you can produce the second step. But then a third step requires a 1.7 molar solution of sodium hydroxide. Well, wait a minute. That's really close to pH 14. That is literally stripping the skin off your bones pH. So I don't know where this is gonna be in the, in the primordial earth, but if you can have these things, and if these chemicals can be manufactured and in series go through these different environments, you can actually get a cyclical reaction to happen. What this is telling us is that the old primordial earth, primordial soup sort of an idea actually requires an organic chemistry lab. It requires a factory like setting where you're getting all these different amazingly complex reactions to happen. I mean, these things don't happen at random. These things took PhD level organic chemists and some of these are Nobel prize discoveries. This is technically precise chemistry happening in very controlled conditions. And if you change those conditions a little bit, you don't get the reactant that you desire. So all of a sudden we're not talking about some warm little pond like Darwin talked about. We're talking about a very complex environment where things are happening in different places on the earth and yet those things preclude the other places and I can't understand it, but I don't think anyone else can either. So why am I talking about the origin of life in my biblical genetics program? Because they specifically talk about the production of uracil. What's uracil? Well, you know, A, T, G, and C, right? Adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Those are the four bases in DNA. Well, RNA has a similar four bases. It has A, C, G, and not T. It has U or uracil. And if you can produce uracil, maybe 
the RNA world hypothesis could be true. See, RNA, a lot of people believe, is the starting point of life because RNA can not only contain information, it can also be a catalyst. RNA can cut things and things like that. There's a lot of RNAs in our bodies that are useful. RNA conglomerations doing work. DNA doesn't do that, but RNA can. Almost like a protein, it can actually do work. So if you could have a coding and working system in the beginning, maybe the RNA world could be true. Now, we're not talking about the origin of A, C, or G, just the U. And we're not talking about all the accessory molecules that are required to make RNA do what it does in the body. There's essentially no chemical reaction in the body that's not as carefully shepherded by probably maybe I don't know, 10 or so different protein enzymes. Nothing in the body happens at random. It's very carefully controlled chemistry. We don't have that luxury in the primordial soup. But here's where this new data set becomes really interesting because they list all the papers that are used in the different steps in all these chemical synthesis pathways. And specifically for uracil, they flashed up on the screen a number of highfalutin chemistry papers the last one I looked at, I squinted at the screen, I read the numbers, I typed them into Google, and I found the paper that documents the production of uracil. And this is the title of the paper. Synthesis and Antifolate Properties of 10 Alkyl 510 Diadiazo Analogs of Methotrexate and Tetrahydrofolic Acid. Did your eyes just glaze over? I mean, I kind of know what that's talking about. I would have to look up a couple of those terms, but I, I know what's generally what's going on, but not in any detail. It takes an organic chemist really to know what that's talking about. But if that's that technical, if this is so complicated that these PhD nerdy chemical scientists have to do all this highfalutin chemistry in order to get uracil, how on earth is it going to happen in a pond or in an ocean? where dilution is a problem, where chemical destruction is a problem, where oxygen and water are acting to destroy the chemicals faster than they can be produced. These are massive problems, and honestly, I'm happy this paper came out. Even though the press releases talk about, like, you know, we're one step closer to the origin of life, the opposite is actually true. Origin of life speculations go all the way back to Charles Darwin and his contemporaries. If there is no possibility for the origin of life scientifically, then evolution is dead in the water, and they know it. And yet, Darwin hemmed and hawed about this. He, he backed up and parried and didn't quite speak clearly many times. In fact, in Origin of Species, he hints at a creator on the last page of the Origin of Species. He writes to his friend Joseph Hooker in 1863, it's four years after the Origin was published. But I have long regretted that I truckled to public opinion and used Pentateuchal term of creation. <laughs> then Darwin, why didn't you say it in public? Why are you such a wimp that you wouldn't say it out front? but now he's complaining about it, the Pentateuchal term of creation, by which I really meant appeared by some wholly unknown process. It's mere rubbish thinking at present of origin of life, one might as well think of the origin of matter. Well, Mr. Darwin, that's called the Big Bang Hypothesis. Secular scientists freely speculate about the origin of matter today, and people have been speculating about the origin of life for a very long time. It's called chemical evolution. Evolution is dependent upon these ideas, because without those ideas, if science tells us the origin of life is not possible, then there's a creator. If there's a creator, you can decide where in the chain of being you want to put your creator. I would put him very late. Therefore, I would be called a young earth creationist, if you like. Some Christians want to put him earlier. They'd be old earth creationists or even evolutionary, you know, theistic evolutionists and things like that. There's all sorts of different versions of theism as it creeps into science. But once the origin of life becomes impossible scientifically, Pandora's box opens up, which is why evolutionists have consistently steered away from the subject and tamped down resistance and alternate ideas. And they have very much closed ranks that we are nothing more than chemicals. So in The Origin of Species, last page, Darwin writes this. Authors of the highest eminence seem to be fully satisfied with the view that each species has been independently created. Is that what the Bible teaches, that God created all things just as they are today? No, that's Aristotle, not Scripture. In fact, we can see species changing in the Jacob's Livestock Experiment, which I talked about on the prior episode of Biblical Genetics. A link to that will be in the show notes. Moving on, he writes, To my mind, it accords better with what we know of the laws impressed upon matter by the Creator, that the production and extinction 
of the past and present inhabitants of the world should have been due to secondary causes like those determining the birth and death of the individual. So here again, he's hinting at a creator. Why? Well, even though he died an atheist, no, he did not become a creationist or a Christian on his deathbed. That's a, a rumor, a myth, urban legend. Creation.com will answer that question if you have it. He totally rejected God. It's clear from his autobiography, clear from his writings, his letters and things like that up to the day he died. But here in 1859, he's still holding on to a vestige, a creator. A couple sentences later, he concludes the book with this. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Well, that's interesting. This grandeur, this poetry, but really nature's red in tooth and claw in this world. Why is there poetry? Why is there beauty? Darwin is really waxing philosophical here in his Origin of Species. He's trying to conclude on a high note. But notice he says, breathe into. Whether it's a few forms or one, put that aside. Breathe into, that is a direct reference to Genesis chapter 1, where God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of the spirit of life. So he's piggybacking on Christian ideas here, even in the Origin of Species. A little while ago, I mentioned the phrase, warm little pond. Where does that phrase, warm little pond, come from? It actually comes from a letter from Darwin to Joseph Hooker, again. This time, later on, it's 1871. He writes this. But if, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond, with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. At present, such matter would be instantly devoured or absorbed, which would not have been the case before living creatures were formed. Wow. Notice, first of all, he has phosphoric salt. So he has phosphorus in his starting conditions, unlike later experiments. That's just a little interesting bit of history. But also, he has gotten rid of his creator. There's no breathing into any forms. He's imagining, in a personal letter, not in print, that life could have spontaneously arisen from simple chemicals. Now, he also writes, at present, such matter will be instantly devoured or absorbed. Maybe... I mean, sure, that's a, an out clause, but one of the questions is if life could have evolved once, why couldn't it have evolved more than once? I mean, why would it be immediately absorbed? What if the new life has toxic chemicals to the old life? What if the new life replaced the old life by poisoning it? Or had a little niche where old life doesn't go, but new life can go? What would prevent the origin of life again, especially now that the world is full of biochemicals? The early world was not full of biochemicals, but the modern world is, has tons of biochemicals. Why could it not happen again? And in fact, interestingly, in the evolutionary scenario, when they look at some of the oldest rocks in the world, they detect signs of life in those rocks. Which means essentially as soon as the earth cooled enough for life to form, life formed. If life is that easy to form, how come it hasn't happened again in the several billion years since? That's a very interesting question. You know, a lot of this creation evolution argument is a top-down argument. We're arguing over little things. Darwin said creatures change. And the modern creationist says, so what? Of course creatures change. God, in his wisdom, created creatures to be adaptable. Duh. So both of us claim the same thing. Creatures change. That's not proof of evolution. If we really want to get at this creation evolution argument, we got to argue bottom up. We got to get to places where the rubber really hits the road, places that where the answer to a question is going to make or break a theory. It's going to really separate one idea from the other. This is why Creation Ministries International did the Evolution's Achilles Heels project, both the book and the documentary. Yeah, it was my brainchild, and I did the draft and the outline, but then all these other people came in, all the PhD scientists came in and weighed in in their area of expertise and basically said, here's what evolution cannot address in my knowledge realm. And one of the subjects that we covered, a very important chapter, was the origin of life. It is powerful and profound. And I want to highlight one of the particular interviews. We uh, talked to Dr. John Sanford. We brought him in to the CMI office and we interviewed him. And he was talking a lot about genetics. But before we wrapped up, he said, okay, hold it, hold it, hold it. I got one more thing to say. He said, this is something that's been on my heart for a long time. And he explained something that I never quite considered and it was brilliant. He said, it doesn't matter. 
you can have all the chemicals you want. You can have millions of years. You can have proteins, you can have nucleotides, you can have sugar chains, you can have cell membranes, but you're not anywhere close to life because life requires information. And that is the biggest hurdle to the evolutionary spontaneous origin of life is where does the instruction set come from? Because even if you could get nucleotides to link together in long chains, they would just be random letters. There's no specified information there. There's nothing that says to the cell, do this or do this in these conditions under the situation. So therefore, life can't even get off the ground and the chemical evolution of life is nothing like the, called the information origin of life. So my goal here was just to impress upon you the complexity of life and the complexity of the origin of life problem. It's not a problem for the creationists, it's a problem for the evolutionists, and it's not getting better. This new massive study only illustrates how difficult the origin of life is. And if the origin of life is scientifically not probable, or even scientifically impossible, then the creator is standing right there, ready to say, oh, by the way, I am God and I created life. In fact, God created you. You're not a bag of chemicals. You're not an accidental reproduction system that's just gone on for a couple of billion years. You actually were created in the image of God and humans were created differently from any other species. We are created to relate to our creator. And science helps us do that when properly understood. Before I go, I want to give a big shout out to all my supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for talking about this. Thank you for pointing other people at my Biblical Genetics YouTube channel and at my Facebook group, Biblical Genetics, and at my podcast, Biblical Genetics. You can find all those online very easily, depending on what platform you're on. Now you can go find the other platform if you like. And thank you also to the people who are financially supporting me. I've chosen to use the Buy Me A Coffee app it's a really simple thing. You just click on the link that'll be in the show notes and you throw me one, three, five, whatever digital coffees. It's just the way I've chosen to allow people to help out on what I think and what a lot of other people think, according to the comments that I'm getting, is a very important subject. Biblical genetics.